Hi everyone, this is uh, Dalton and I'd like to welcome you to our online service at Pine Town Baptist and this is Wendy, my lovely wife. Ah. Ah, it is great to have you with us today. You've really been missed. Huh. Can you tell us something about our Facebook? Yes, uh, we hope you've been making use of our Facebook page, our website or our YouTube channel so we can stay in contact. Uh, awesome, you know you. If you need some help um, or you'd like to receive some messages or daily devotions, Please don't hesitate to contact us and uh, even Pastor Dennis uh, is so willing to help us. Uh, so make sure that you stay in touch with us. I'm going to give him a blessing. May you be blessed today when we listen to the message by Pastor Dennis. Be steadfast, immovable, always, always abounding, abounding in the work of the Lord. Lord. everyone. Thank you for joining us. This morning we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 12 verses 35 through 48. It's a parable or as some commentators think two parables in one and it's all about servanthood and it's all about servanthood as the Lord is preparing to return to our world and to consummate human history and gather us to himself. 
It's a fairly obscure parable. You know, with the parable of the sower or the Good Samaritan or uh, the parable of the prodigal son, we have names for them. We are familiar with them. But even if you are a reader of the Bible uh, and somewhat familiar with your Bible, uh, this particular parable may have passed you by. It's not one of the better known ones. It doesn't even have a name. So I've given us the title, Ready for Service. Now, where this parable takes place uh, is right after the parable of the rich fool that we looked at a few weeks ago. And in between that parable in the earlier part of Luke 12, Jesus then from there moves on to talk about the, the foolishness of, of caring about riches in this life. So he says to his disciples, uh, don't be anxious uh, about this world. It has pleased the Father, O little flock, he tells them in verse 20, uh, to give you the kingdom. And, and in comparison, <laughs> having the, the heavenly kingdom, the kingdom of God is your possession. Well, then the, the cares of this world just are fleeting. Uh, don't worry about what you will eat or what you will wear. Uh, don't worry about these things. The Lord knows that you need them all. But seek first his kingdom and its righteousness, we are told in Luke 12. Well, from there, as he's finishing up his, um, his teaching of the disciples to uh, say no to the uh, rich fool's priorities and to say yes to the kingdom of God, he says actually in verse 34, right before we get to this parable, Jesus says, uh, send your treasure on up ahead. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So Jesus is saying to you and me, if you are a Christian this morning, what Jesus is saying is you don't really need to be anxious about this life. In comparison to the riches of heaven, uh, <laughs> well, there's no comparison. To the glory of taking hold of the prize of the upward calling in Christ Jesus, well, then don't worry about this world. The Lord will take care of you. He knows you need uh, the food, the, the, the clothes on your back. He knows you need, you have needs. Uh, he'll take care of that. You focus on that which is future, on that which is ahead. You get yourself prepared, particularly now with this parable, on the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as I've been noticing and talking with people uh, throughout the past several weeks, there's a heightened awareness that something is up. And for Christians, uh, people are saying, is this the time the Lord is returning? And there's so much about the return of the Lord that we find in scriptures, particularly from the lips of Jesus himself, that you simply cannot pass up an important parable like this one, even though it's relatively obscure. So as we begin to look at it, I'm going to ask that we pray now, but then with an open mind and a clear understanding of where we're headed, realize that the Lord is asking you to place very little weight uh, on this world and a great deal of weight on preparing for the return of Christ and readying yourself for the coming of the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for uh, this parable. We're praying that we too, as Jesus is uh, commanding us and commending to us, to be ready for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ and to be good servants of our master uh, that he finds serving well upon your return. So Father, grant that we might gain much from this parable this morning, enlighten our minds so that we might be fitted for heaven. And we would thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 12, and we're going to be looking, first of all, at verses 35 and 36. Let's have a look at those uh, together. Be dressed ready for service, and keep your lamps burning, like men waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet, so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. Jesus is telling us in this parable that the master of the house has left the house and has gone off to a wedding banquet. And what he is commending to us at the very outset is to be ready for service. He says here, be dressed, ready for service. And what that would have been understood as by the disciples as well as the people of that day is that they needed to, uh, as the King James would say, gird their loins. What that meant was is that everybody, men and women, wore these long robes that nearly touched the ground. And so for walking purposes, that's fine. For sitting, that's modest, that's fine. Uh, but when you are going to involve yourself in physical activity, physical labor, well, you needed to lift this robe and uh, just a little, maybe up to your ankle, and then you would 
uh, tie a rope around your waist or a belt of some kind, and therefore you were free then to move and to uh, get on with the uh, labors that, uh, that were at hand. Uh, Jesus said to his disciples, uh, prior to my return, what you need to do is you need to be actively serving me, uh, prepared for my return. Uh, your torches need to be lit. Your lamps need to be burning. These are the same torches that we looked at with the parable of the ten virgins a few weeks ago. Um, they're, they're lit even before the sun goes down so that you don't have to fumble around in the dark. You need to be watchful, careful, and fully prepared for the time that your master returns. You need to keep your torches lit, your lamps burning. You need to be active in service to our Savior, even during times of difficulty and the coming distress that certainly is coming upon the world prior to the Lord's return. You need to be looking anxiously and even longing for the return of your master. He's off at a wedding banquet, which to cut to the chase, Jesus is describing that Christ has died and given up his life. He's been raised from the dead, he's been exalted to his Father's right hand, and now he is rejoicing with all the saints that have gone before us, with the hosts of heaven, the cherubim and seraphim. But now the Lord is, you can almost get this sense in this parable, is, is anxious in a holy way, in a righteous way. He's desiring to leave heaven's portals, to slip away from all the activities and the beauty and the glory and the joy and the celebrating in heaven to come and retrieve his people whom he loves who are longing for his return and who are under great distress. God's heart is being poured out in compassion toward his servants, toward his slaves who are waiting anxiously for his return. So let's carry on and take a look at verses 37 and 38 with me if you would. Here's 37, here's 38. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. I tell you the truth, he will dress himself to serve, will have them recline at the table, and will come and wait on them. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them ready, even if he comes in the second or third watch of the night. Jesus is saying that he is earnest about leaving the wedding party. The banquet that's taking place, he's in a sense, the, the picture we are given in this parable is of Christ slipping away, our master, our Lord, our King. And he's, he's almost surreptitiously slipping away from all of the festivities of heaven. He's making his way back home. Um, and when he gets there, he, he knocks quietly. This might be just an extension of this massive mansion. He doesn't want to cause a fuss. But all it needs is a, a gentle tap. And these slaves, these servants of the Lord, readily open the door and embrace the Savior, looking for his return, gladdened at the sight of him who has died for them. This is the master whom they love and whom they love to serve. It will be good for such servants, Jesus says, when I return, who are actively involved in ministering in my name, in giving the cup of cold water in Jesus' name, in tending to my church and caring for my people and loving one another and serving one another and who are involved in Christian ministry. Jesus says something extraordinary here that I want us to take note of that we just read. Jesus will slip away and take off his, into some room somewhere in this mansion. He will take off his wedding uh, gear, his wedding outfit, his garment, He'll put on the garment of a slave. And he will actually come back to his children, his servants, his slaves. These are just the day laborers that are being described here. And he'll have them sit down at a banquet table. And he will actually serve them. Wait a minute. <laughs> are you saying that the God of the universe, when he returns from heaven, is going to have us sit down, and it's the picture, of course, is now the banquet in heaven. Blessed are those who are invi invited to the banquet supper of the Lamb. Uh, and it's going to be that Christ, as the host, is going to, is, is going to get up and have his, his children seated, and he's actually going to serve us. Well, where did he get the food? Well, you get the sense that he, he, did a, he, he bagged some of the goodies from heaven itself from the banquet there, 
and he brought it he's bringing heaven with him and he is going to serve us the blessings of his heaven they're going to be poured out in abundance upon those who are faithfully serving the master well when you think about that that's just ridiculous uh, you're a sinner i'm a sinner we don't deserve to have such care and love such compassion such a boon as to not only be saved and rescued and healed and forgiven, but to have the God of the universe who flung the stars into space and who's given us everything we need for life and godliness. This God is actually going to serve a sinner like you and me. No, Lord. No, no, that's just going too far. Until we realize that he gave up his life for us. That the God of the universe bled and died for us. Or, or for instance, there in the upper room, right before Jesus goes to the cross. Turn with me to John 13. When you take a look at John 13, you're, you're as uh, amazed as Peter was in that text. Take a look at John 13 with me, verses 4 through 9. Let's have a look. John 13, 4 through 9. So he got up from the meal took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter and said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered, unless I wash you. You have no part with me. And then Lord Simon Peter replied, Not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Well, Jesus goes on to say, Peter, you're cleansed, you're washed, you're forgiven, you don't need a full bath. But just like all Christians, we need to daily confess sin. You need your feet washed. You need to be cleansed so that you can be useful. You need to ask for cleansing each and every day. We all need to do that. But the thing that I want to point out there is that Peter's reaction is the same as your reaction and mine. Why is it that the God of the universe, the rabbi, Messiah, Jesus, is actually taking the role of a servant and washing sinners' feet? Well, you can't change the nature of our God. How grateful we are that our God is our God. This is a God who loves to forgive sinners, who loves with an unconditional love who is no less powerful, no less holy, no less mighty, no uh, less glorious for stooping down and washing his disciples' filthy feet. And he leaves that uh, action, that servanthood, uh, as an example for us. Now that you have seen what I have done for you, do that for your church. Do that for my church. Be ready. Be uh, uh, serving. Uh, be hard at work living for Christ, growing in grace, becoming more like Jesus upon my return. And may you be giving the cup of cold water in Jesus' name. Well, let's go on. Let's take a look at verses 39 and 40 that are still part of this first parable. It says this, But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Jesus is telling us that to be ready, uh, you have to be prepared for a sudden reappearing of the Savior. The Lord is actually picturing himself as a thief. Jesus is coming like a thief. If you know that a thief is coming to your home, you're going to wall up the place. You're going to get the ammunition out. You're going to get uh, the, the security company on, on hand. You're going to be prepared and you're going to overwhelm that thief before he can even get started. But it's the very action of a thief to come when you least expect him to come. He breaks in and he binds you, uh, ties you up and steals all of your goods. Well, Jesus says that when he comes, it's going to be an unexpected coming. It's going to be, even though we're preparing, it's going to come suddenly. It might even come at midnight or even later. Uh, any time of the day or night, you have your torches lit. You be serving. You be active in uh, Christ's community of faith. You be a, a part of the kingdom of God, serving the Lord valiantly, no matter day or night, you be prepared, spiritually prepared. 
uh, a person who's learned how to pray, who, who knows your Bible, who's, who's growing in grace and seeking to give the cup of cold water in Jesus' name. You want to be doing uh, Christ-like things, and you want to be Christ-like when the Lord returns. You don't want to have one foot in the world and one foot in the church. It's not, that's not going to cut it. In fact, Jesus goes on to describe that very thing. In the next few verses, we have Peter asking, Lord, are, are you telling this parable to us? Or to someone else. Here's verse 40 to 42. Let's have a, have a look. And Peter asked, Lord, are you telling this parable to us or to everyone? The Lord answered, who then is the faithful and wise manager, whom the master puts in charge of his servants to give them their food allowance at the proper time? It will be good for that servant whom the master finds doing so when he returns. I tell you the truth, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. Well, Jesus, to answer Peter's question, is saying, um, it's not just to you. It's going to be for all of my servants down through history, down through the ages. Peter, it is for you and for the other disciples, but it's also going to be for all of those who call upon my name. And those people who are serving the Lord, who have particularly uh, positions of ministry, uh, some authority and some leadership in the church, he's talking about the stewards here, people who serve others. They're at a, they're, they're, they've been given a charge of different tasks. So maybe you're a Sunday school teacher or a deacon. Maybe you are head of the women's ministry or you're an elder. Maybe you're a pastor. Maybe uh, you have some ministry among the children. Whatever you are doing, you hold a Bible study in your home. Whatever it is that you're doing that ministers to God's people, blessed are you if the Lord, when he returns in power and great glory, finds you serving even during difficult times, times of real distress. That will be a good thing. Now, Jesus says uh, there are some options, though. There are some servants out there that will not be ready. And he gives us warnings. In fact, he gives us three examples to finish out this parable of real warning regarding not being prepared. Here's the first one. Take a look with me at verse 45 and following. But suppose the servant says to himself, my master is taking a long time in coming. And he then begins to beat the maid, men servants and maid servants and to eat and drink and get drunk. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him. And at an hour he is not aware of, he will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers. Well, there's the first example of someone who's not serving, who's not prepared. This is an individual who actually is a fake. He's a fraud servant of God. He's in the church, he knows the people, he's grown up in the church, but there's no vital signs of spiritual life. In fact, the minute he thinks that uh, there's no reason to be afraid of God, he loses his fear of the Lord and the consequences of not abiding and obeying the Lord, well, he begins to act out his own natural self. I can't help but think of your health and wealth crowd who are living for today and who are uh, always prying money out of God's people. I, I think of the false teachers that just proliferate uh, this entire continent of Africa, the entire continents of North and South America, Europe, Asia, you name it. We've got thousands of these characters who are peddlers of the word of God. Paul was confronted with them everywhere he went. People who were peddling the word for profit. People who... Uh, would abuse God's church. And he says, those kinds of servants, I've got a place for them. I'm going to cut them to pieces. It's very strong language. I'm going to assign them with Satan and his angels. I'm going to cast them into hell. Well, if you're just playing games with the Lord, tremble at a statement like this from the lips of God, the lips of the Lord Jesus. But now to conclude the parable, the Lord gives us two final examples of stewards. Faithful, ready in service, completely unfaithful, and prepared for hell. But now two other possible servant types. And we're going to look at those now to conclude the study on, the, on this parable of servanthood. Uh, here, the, here it is in verse 47 and following. The servant who knows his master's will and does not get ready or does not do what his master wants will be beaten with many blows. But the one who does not know and does things deserving punishment will be beaten with few blows.
From everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. While Jesus is talking about servanthood, he's given us first the primary example of faithful servanthood. Be prepared. Be ready for service. Uh, uh, be ready for action and activity. And then there's the second servant who's useless and profitless and who is actually antagonistic towards his master and uh, abuses the church and his privileges. But now you have two examples. The first one is of someone who loves the Lord, um, is involved in church life, but also has become mired and, uh, and, and finds himself or herself so preoccupied with the things of this world. It's a tough time. This time before the end, the, there's the, uh, uh, the authoritarianism that we're already feeling now. Uh, the oppression whenever they can use some excuse to take away your liberties. We're, we're already getting the foreshadowings of that. Uh, and, and so now the time has really gotten difficult where they're monitoring everything the Christian does. And, and so this, this child of the king who, who loves the Lord Jesus, wants to serve the Savior, but just is finding that life is uh, taking its toll. And therefore, while they know their Bibles, they're simply not uh, being uh, bu busy in the things of Christ and his kingdom. Well, I tell you, the Lord says to such a servant, here's your warning. Brother, sister, here's your warning. Here's mine. You know your Bible. Uh, you have the availability of prayer and the Holy Spirit indwelling you, and yet uh, you're squandering what you know. Uh, and, you're, and you're mired down with the anxieties of life. It's choking you out. Be fearful of that. Brother, sister, let me bring home more application in that regard. So often we can fall into that category. Uh, we know the Lord. Uh, he has saved us and redeemed us. There's no longer any condemnation. So thanks be to God that our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. But the Lord is talking about the removal of rewards, eternal rewards, the, a, a good spanking for one of his children who refuses to be busy about the Lord's work and ministry and life and service during times when the Lord would be calling upon you to serve him diligently, valiantly for truth. Then the final type of servant is someone who simply is not all that exposed to the scriptures. They've heard enough, they know the Lord, they have fallen in love with the Lord and the Lord has redeemed them. But they're perhaps in an area where they get very little Bible teaching, the preaching is poor, the teaching is poor, um, they maybe are illiterate themselves. There's millions of Christians in our world who are unable to read. They're completely dependent on someone else telling them about the Lord and growing them in grace. They're dependent on listening rather than reading. Well, the Lord is saying, if, if these people who want to serve me are, are wanting to, to serve me faithfully, and yet they're so ill-equipped so that sometimes they're teaching children and they completely miss what the Bible is saying about our Savior. They're unable to teach much. They're unable to equip others. Well, such a person, though they belong to Jesus, uh, is going to be spanked far more lightly. The rebuke will be far less severe uh, versus those who, who know better. And then at the very end of the parable that we just read, Jesus says, those who have been given much will be demanded much. Well, I tell you, I tremble at that because I've had so many privileges. I, I've had the, the privilege of training and, and uh, study, and I've had years of pastoral ministry. Lord, at the end, would I fail you? Well, I tremble at the thought, and, and you should as well. The idea that we won't be busily, happily, joyfully serving our master. And then when you consider the example of the Lord Jesus, brother, sister, when you think of what he did for us, and when that, that vision of Jesus washing Peter's feet comes back to mind, when you think that Jesus is telling us that when he returns, if he finds you faithfully serving, and, 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 and he's stooping down to wash your feet at the wedding supper of the Lamb, when you are being fed all of the bounties and excellencies of heaven, when you are there with all of God's people to rejoice, well, I tell you, it prompts you to be like Jesus. Lord, make me faithful. May I be serving you faithfully as our servant king served us.
Oh, I tell you, <laughs> this Jesus of ours, this great and powerful and mighty God whom we worship, he's the servant king. And he gives us an example to follow right until journey's end. May you be found faithful, brother, sister, friend, happily serving the Savior when he comes again. Maranatha, Lord, come quickly and find me happily serving my Savior on that great day. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, how we thank you for this parable, ready to serve longing to be of service to our King. Make us good servants, Lord. We want to be ready and prepared and watchful and careful and prayerful on that great day that our Savior comes in power and great glory. Thank you, Father, for your Son's example of self-giving love. We see it most poignantly at the cross. We see him dying for sinners there. And we remember his words, I have come not to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. How we thank you, Lord, and how gladly we submit to his rule in our lives and how happily we serve him even this day with great joy and thanksgiving. We bless your name and pray, Lord, make us good and faithful servants right to the very end. And we would thank you in Jesus' name.
Worship to the sun.